Hello, welcome to Jules Says. I'm Jules, Julie, grandmother. Big news this week, my daughter Catherine had her baby, a girl, Fena Grace Kutstra. I was surprised they're calling her Kutstra. I thought they were going to give a baby girl Catherine's surname and a baby boy Bobby's, but whatever, their decision. Maybe they were just joking about that. But wouldn't you know, Violet and Fred were almost born en route to the hospital. But just when Catherine decides she'd be better off having a baby at home than possibly in a car, I don't blame her, Fenna takes her sweet time. (sighs) I'm sure Catherine will share details on telling everybody everything because she does tell everybody everything. I wasn't there, but maybe it's just as well that no one told me she was in labor until after Fenna had been delivered safely. But at least after she was born, they did let me know right away. When my grandson Richard was born, I got a call from Joanne's then-husband. I think it was two days later. Thanks. Maybe I need to examine what I'm doing wrong as a mother. I think I'm a thoughtful, loving mother. I don't pressure them to do anything for me or to visit me, even though they do do lots of things for me. I don't pressure them to do it, and I don't criticize. When I do have an opportunity to visit, I try to be simultaneously helpful and unobtrusive. Maybe I've got it all wrong. Maybe I should be more demanding. Maybe if I laid on a nice, thick guilt trip and bitched, I'd be invited to weddings and christenings. Maybe they'd let me know before their babies were born. Huh. I don't really mean any of that. But there are people who look at me a little askance when these topics come up. I can see the cogs turning. They're thinking, what has she done to deserve being excluded? But it makes sense if you think about it. If you're going to elope, it's not an elopement if your mother is invited. And then if you invite your mom, you have to invite everyone else. Like, it's just a slippery slope. So I'm actually not offended by that at all. My bigger concern is the marriage, because you know my views on marriage. I think it's very risky, and I think it should not be undertaken lightly. But anyway, maybe you're saving your mom anxiety if you don't let her know until after the baby is born. I'm thousands of miles away anyway, so what can I do? What can I do to help? Nothing. Carrie and I were actually laughing last night about the car accident she was in when she was, I don't know, I think she was only 16. She kept telling the paramedics, the nurses, and the doctor at the hospital when they insisted they had to call me. You're a minor. We have to call your mom. Oh, she's tired, Carrie insisted. She has to work in the morning. Tell her I'm fine. Assure her that she should go back to sleep. And that is exactly what they did. They all did such a great job of assuring me that nothing was wrong, that I did go back to sleep. Oh, it's just a formality. Don't worry. Everything's fine. Everyone's fine. We just have to process the paperwork. And then when I went to pick her up at the hospital, I was uh, shocked to see her hobble out looking as though she'd been rolled down a hill in a barrel. I mean, she was fine. She wasn't seriously injured. But this weekend, she said, oh, yeah, the paramedics said they've never seen an accident that bad where someone wasn't killed. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Maybe it is better if I just didn't know at the time. It's actually very sweet of them to try not to worry me. But I'm a big girl. I can handle the truth. And I'd rather maybe be there for emotional support, even if it is thousands of miles away. And because I'm not an overtly emotional, crying worrier, maybe they think, I don't care, but I do feel these things deeply. Whenever one of my daughters has a baby, I actually feel raw for a couple of weeks because I just think it's so hard to carry the baby, give birth, and then care for a newborn. It's worth it, but it's hard. For a few weeks, I I walk around through my life looking at, at crowds of people and marveling that every one of them, every one of you was once someone's baby. Someone did this for each and every one of us. Just today, 
I walked past several people begging on the street in below zero weather, and it makes me sadder than usual because my daughter just recently had a baby again, and it makes me wonder what on earth went wrong for you to end up here. You were someone's baby, completely helpless, at the mercy of whoever held you, cared for you, or didn't. When Catherine was born, when I held her and looked at her, I just could not believe that my mother Dorothy loved me this much. I really didn't get it. And that love becomes scarier when they're grown up because you can't protect them or shelter them like you can when they're little. You have to let them make their own decisions. Well, you have to let them. They're going to make their own decisions. But their pain feels so much worse than your own pain. So I guess we've come full circle. They protect me now. I said I'm not a crier, but I do tear up. I get verklempt. Whenever I watch children perform, I love dance recitals, even if none of mine are in them. I, I love that. When I watch the Olympics, I'm just so proud of those athletes. I can't even imagine the time and the effort and the sacrifice that goes into these, these seemingly effortless superhuman performances. And I can't even watch someone pretend to have a baby in a film or a TV show, not even in a humorous situation, like like when Phoebe was giving birth on the show Friends. Even then, I tear up. Everyone else is laughing, and I'm just like, oh, I just get verklempt. Because having a baby is hard. And I am so grateful for my three healthy daughters and my four healthy grandchildren. At the end of the day, that truly is all that matters. So Hanukkah has started and Christmas is coming and it's ridiculous that I always end up thinking, oh, wow, Christmas already? Only in a few days? It's bananas. Catherine requested that we not send gifts this year since, of course, they have everything they could possibly need. So I will respect her request. I'm not creative enough to come up with good gifts for people who have everything. I wish I were. Since Joanne and my grandson Richard live in British Columbia, I don't shop in a store for them. I shop online and have their presents shipped. Gifts are always optional, though. Always. But particularly gifts for adults. So there's no pressure or expectation for me to buy for anyone, which is quite freeing. If you are the kind of person who agonizes over gifts, it might be nice to give yourself a break and just stop. If you see something a person would like, get it. If not, no expectations. And if an adult expects a gift, then they need to grow the fuck up. I received a gift in the mail of a Betty White golden book. If, if you've never seen a golden book, it's a little children's book about Betty White I got this from a dear friend of mine, Terry. What a thoughtful gift. She just saw that and picked it up and sent it to me in the post. That is the kind of gift you want. Now, I am I feel a bit badly that I didn't send her anything, but she knows that if I had seen something that I thought she would like, I would. There's no pressure. However, this weekend, Abe and I took a nice long walk and went into a couple of shops to get a few things we needed. And lo and behold, the dreaded Christmas music. I had been thinking recently that, oh, I haven't heard a lot of Christmas music this year. And then I suddenly realized it's because I haven't been going into any stores. Abe has been off work since around mid-October. He started a new job this week. And he's been getting all the groceries. And I don't listen to music on the radio anymore. I listen to news and I stream music or listen to podcasts. In the olden days with radio and no online shopping, you couldn't escape the Christmas music. I used to get so sick of hearing it. But because I've been working from home and I hardly ever even go to the grocery store these last few weeks, I've avoided it. The other thing I noticed when we were shopping uh, that I really dislike maybe you can relate, is the cashier asking if you'd like to add a donation to a charity. Am I the only one who resents this? Am I, am I a bit of a prick? 
you're standing there, the cashier's looking at you, the people in the queue are looking at you, and I can't help feeling like a bit of a dick for saying no. But I always say no. I resent this sales tactic so much. Canada used to have a $100 donation tax deduction, and you could claim it with no receipts. Quite a few years ago, they took that away, which, whatever, most of us donate small amounts in our day-to-day lives, so I think that little $100 tax credit, I mean, why even put it on your tax return? It was kind of a stupid rule anyway. Maybe an awareness thing. But maybe if we still had that little tax benefit that you didn't have to prove, I might be more inclined to say yes to the cashier. But back in the day, cashiers didn't ask you for donations. I think their computer systems certainly weren't sophisticated enough to handle that kind of a transaction. But here's the thing. We pay a lot of tax, and a lot of that money is wasted. I've said it before. I don't mind paying tax. I want society to have roads and support and education. And I think if society believes something is worthwhile and governments collect tax, our tax dollars should support the worthwhile things. Public infrastructure, social infrastructure like education, health care, child care, technical and medical research. We all complain about big pharma, justifiably, absolutely justifiably. But part of the problem is no one is motivated to invest in scientific research without the probability of financial gain. So we donate to tax-deductible charities for cancer research, ALS, whatever the illness is. But then that becomes a big business in and of itself. And they have to have admin and marketing to try and convince you to donate. How much of that money actually goes to the research? I don't know. Cancer treatment costs the healthcare system a lot of money. Serious illnesses have other indirect costs. Loss of productivity, loss of tax income, not only for the patient, but often the caregivers who have to reduce their working hours or earnings to care for people. Free caregiving is a cost to society. We need the caregiving, but it's not really free. And I'm just using this as one example. So since our tax dollars fall short in so many areas, we have a system where people can donate to a charity, which may or may not be wasteful or nefarious. And as a reward, we get a little tax deduction for the donation. I donate to charities I care about, and I donate to charities that people's loved ones care about after someone passes away all the time. I don't think it's the best way to fund school or youth programs or medical research, but that's the system we have, so I go along with it. However, if I hand money over to a store, they may or may not actually make the donation. They probably do. I'm sure they get audited. But let's assume they do. Now they're getting the tax deduction for my donation. Unacceptable, just on principle. One time I asked... I'm such a bitch. I asked the cashier if she could give me a tax receipt for my donation. And she looked at me with this stunned expression. I don't think anyone had ever asked that before. And I immediately felt badly because she's a cashier just doing her minimum wage or barely more job. She wasn't prepared for a question like that. So I just I I backtracked. I just said, I'm sorry. I'm well aware that you can't give me a tax receipt. I shouldn't have asked, but I kind of want you to know that no tax receipt is why I'm declining to donate. It's not because I'm a prick. So think about that the next time a cashier asks you for a donation. Or the next time you judge someone ahead of you in the queue for not giving a donation at the cashier. Why then, you might logically think, Am I okay with handing out cash to people on the street? Because they aren't taking it and turning it around for a corporate tax deduction. Well, I mean, it's unlikely that they're doing that. Who knows? Maybe they're shills for some corporation. I'm okay with not getting the tax deduction as long as a corporation isn't stealing my tax deduction. Anyway, back to the Christmas music. Surprisingly, the music did not 
thoroughly annoy me as it has in the past. And that's probably because I haven't been in enough public spaces since the end of October to overdose on it. I'm still going to do my Christmas album next year, though. I'm saying it again to hold myself to it. And in the meantime, on last week's podcast, I said I would let you know how my show went. This past Sunday night, I performed three of my songs at the Comedy Bar in Toronto. The Crimson Wave Comedy Show is hosted by two women, and there was a lineup of five comedians and me. The night before, however, Abe and I went to a party with Carrie and Allen in Funky Town. That's what I call the Queen Street West neighborhood in Toronto. This party was at a gorgeous two-bedroom loft flat with a very spacious terrace, room for plenty of seating, a fire table, and a barbecue, which is a Canadian staple. Many of us barbecue even in the winter. Before we went to the party, Abe mixed me a couple of cocktails, tequila, lemon, and sparkling water, delicious, and we played cards. Carrie and Alan arrived, and the four of us went together. This party was great. Ah, uh, the hosts had beautiful, festive Christmas decorations, so many delicious hors d'oeuvres, including deviled eggs and smoked salmon, two things I rarely have the pleasure to indulge in. They had vegan spring rolls for Abe, and I paced myself. I drank sparkling wine and a few more tequilas, but then I went outside to the fire table, and I'm sorry to say that I smoked two menthol cigarettes. I should not smoke, but I don't have the addictive gene, so I can have a cigarette or two and then leave them, which I feel is a gift. But these menthol cigarettes were imported from the United States of America because they're not allowed in Canada. We cannot have cigs or vape products that might appeal to children. So your cigarette or your vape has to taste like tobacco. But when I was young, we used to buy menthol cigarettes all the time in December. We called them candy canes. Anyway, I had two cigarettes. Now, We got home from this party by about 11, not super late, and even though I had taken care not to go overboard, my dalliance in debauchery was still enough to cause a bit of a headache and dry mouth on Sunday. Maybe that's because I'm old. I'm sure that wouldn't have happened when I was 25. No matter, I thought. I have until tonight. I wasn't hungover. I was just tired and headachey and dry mouth. I did whatever I had to do that day, ran some errands, but I was coughing a lot. I'm sure it was just from the two cigs and the dehydration. I'm not sick, but still, I was really kicking myself because even though I know I'm not Michael Buble or the boobster, as I call him, I was singing in this show, and I wanted to at least sound decent. Later in the day, I put on some music to sing with. This was my vocal warm-up. I have actual vocal warm-ups that I could do, but I don't like doing them when people are around. It's, yeah, makes me uncomfortable. But singing along to a bunch of songs helped, cleared everything out. I'd be fine. But as the time grew near, I started with the nerves. Why? I kept telling myself, if you bomb, no one will get hurt. Why can't you just relax? No one's going to die if you die on stage. But doing a set of something you've written yourself in a comedy show is very way scarier than doing a play written by someone else that you've rehearsed again and again and again with a director. This was way more terrifying. I said to Abe, I understand why so many performers have drug and addiction problems. I really wish there was a way to punch down these nerves. But I just had to talk myself out of it. About an hour before the show, I went upstairs to put on my glittery navy full-length dress, the dress I wore to Carrie's wedding. I really like that dress. I bought it online a few years ago because I saw it on sale. And I knew the cut of it would be flattering, and it has long sleeves. And you know, if you are actively looking for a dress for an occasion, you're not going to find one. So the best thing to do is have one on the back burner. I put on that dress. Shit, 
I had forgotten about the thigh-high slit. And in the dead of December, my legs are more, um, I would say, a splotchy purple than white. So I got out some of that leg spray and slapped what was left of it on. It, it was almost gone. And hoped for the best. I added a bit more eye makeup. I even put in a hair piece to give my thin, tragic hair a little more oomph. Red stiletto pumps in my bag. Abe and I walked the very cold 10 minutes to the venue. A good friend of mine, Laura, and her partner, Chris, were already there when we arrived. They were having a drink. Oh boy, that made me more nervous. I think doing something like this is easier when you don't know anyone in the audience. Not only that, poor Chris had just flown in from the UK that afternoon. It was so generous of them to be there under the circumstances. Then our friends Holly and Satish arrived. I don't know if you understand how generous it is for regular business people such as me who have to work in the morning to go to a Sunday night show that doesn't start until 9.30. By the time it's underway, it's bedtime. I do not take the generosity of their presence and support for granted. But what if I was terrible? Andrew Johnston's mother, Cheryl, and his brother, Robin, arrived. At least I could comfort myself that they were here to see Andrew, but my nerves just started running away with me. My mouth and throat were so dry. Abe asked if he could get me a drink, which I declined because I thought, oh, I don't want anything cold and booze might dry my throat out more. But then I ended up drinking his drink. The show was about to start. I felt a little more calm when the audience went into the space to their seats, but still I was constantly coughing and sipping water with no relief for this dry-mouthed nervousness. Why do I do this to myself? What made me think I could do this? Why? I'll, I'll tell you why. Because we regret the things we don't do. That's why. Even if something scares you, even if it's an irrational fear, you need to just do it. So I was on fourth in the lineup, which I think is a pretty sweet spot. It might have been nice to be first and get it out of the way, but it's also nice to have the audience warmed up. So cool. Natalie, one of the hosts, told me I had eight minutes. Uh-oh. At first I thought I had seven, then I thought I had ten, and I know each of my songs is about two minutes, and I had talk a bit in between. Maybe I'll have to cut out some of my opening and in-between ch chat. I tried to breathe deeply. No more coughing aloud. This was it. I was introduced. I walked on, took the mic, and launched into my preamble to I'll Be Drunk for Christmas. And people laughed, even in places I didn't think they would. And it wasn't just my people. That was quite a relief. And I know it's not brain surgery. But they seemed to even like the song. I sipped from my Merry Fucking Christmas flask as I sat on the stool and sang it in a heartfelt way. A few words to segue into It's the Most Dangerous Time of the Year, something about sadness and dysfunctional families which a lot of us can relate to, but I was worried it would be a bit of a downer, but they laughed, so thank you. I started my third song, Oh Horny Night, a couple of bars early, but held the note and recovered, so fine. When I finished, enthusiastic applause. Thank you. Nerves now evaporated like magic. No more coughing, no more dry mouth. I went inside and watched Andrew Johnston's set from the back, which, of course, was perfectly polished, perfectly timed, campy and confident. When the show was over, my friends and loved ones told me they enjoyed it, they thought I had done well, but they might have said that either way, although I did feel as though it did actually go pretty well. But I knew how nervous I was, and later on, I ruminated about how I should or could have done this or that differently to make it better. Well, one of the things I love about live performance is the excitement of the moment, the energy. You only get one take when you're on that stage. Who knows? Maybe I will do it again someday. Thank you for listening. If you have anything you'd like to share or ask, you can email me at jewelsays at gmail.com. Have a wonderful 
Hanukkah, Christmas, holiday season, whatever you're celebrating. And if you're celebrating nothing, I hope you enjoy that too and maybe get a little time off work. And if you're spending the season alone, I hope you enjoy your own company and do and eat all the things you love. I'll be back next week.